All right, now back to this page. We've got uh, diamond, which is which is much greater than all the other things here. This is supposed to be what makes diamonds so desirable for jewelry because uh, they have such a high index of refraction that when light enters them, uh, they talk about diamonds and their fire, light gets bent a lot more entering into those and therefore they sparkle more than a same cut, uh, same cut kind of piece of glass or something like that, or cubic zirconia. Uh, this is the thing is they, they actually have now, you can make artificial materials that are, are much less expensive than diamond that have a higher index now. And uh, my wife still doesn't want that, even though I tried to argue with her that it would be prettier, she did not care. She wanted the diamond. So, uh, you know, I don't, y'all draw your own conclusion from that, I guess. I don't know what to say. Uh, I, I don't know, maybe she just didn't trust me. So anyway, uh, bigger the index, the slower it goes, the more its light is going to bend when it goes into it. Uh, here we have Snell's Law. It's a version of that law we just had on the previous page where we substituted out. And you get up with uh, N1 sine theta 1 and then N2 sine theta 2. So anytime you have a wave change medium, you do get some reflection, which you can see here in the picture. It's somewhat, it's reflecting off that first part, but then also some transmit. And this transmits according to this law. If you want to think of it this way, you can think of this as the index of the incident material times the sine of the incident angle is equal to the index of the refracting material times the sine of the refracting angle. This would be, sorry, this, this 60 degrees here, this would be theta 1 or theta i, whichever way you want to do it, would be that 60. And this would be the refracting angle or theta 2, the second material. The material it goes into versus the material it comes out of. If you notice, uh, it's bending toward the normal as it's going from this is, this is low index which is a high speed and it's going into a high index, a high N with a low speed. So whenever you go to think about these, like that barrel example I gave you where we rolled it from concrete, right back here a few pages where we rolled it and it was going from concrete into grass. And as it went onto that concrete, it went from low speed to high speed and it bent away from the normal. And as we, if we went the other way, if it went from concrete into grass, it would slow down when it first hit and so it'd been toward the normal, all right? And so that's what you've got to think of when you do these, whether or not it'll been toward the normal or away from the normal. So this is like, here is our barrel coming in. And as soon as it gets here, you know, we have this speed and this speed, this speed is still fast. And then this one greatly slows down, which makes it turn toward the normal. Right? And so then the barrel will go off in this direction. And once they're both in there, they both are slow. Okay? And so we can tell that from looking at this, that that is how it is. So before you start thinking about whether or not it'll bend toward or away from the normal, remember to switch it from index to speed. High index means low speed. Low index means high speed. Okay? So if you're given indices of refraction, that's how you can figure this out. If you look over here, you can see that uh, it is bending more toward the normal for glass, which would indicate that glass has a higher index of refraction than the water in this picture. It's been to a 35 degree angle, whereas the other one bent to 40 with the same incident angle. Okay? And then you can just use Snell's law for that. Next. Uh, we have some basic properties. Uh, when a ray of light enters a medium where its speed decreases, it is bent toward the normal. We just talked about that. When a ray of light enters a medium where its speed increases, it is bent away from the normal. We just talked about that. There is no change in direction of propagation if there is no change in index of refraction. In other words, if it goes from air to air, 
it's going to stay the same, assuming the air is at the same temperature. Of course, if you change the temperature of air, the index of refraction changes, which is something we will talk about shortly. Uh, the greater the change in index of refraction, the greater the change in propagation direction. So in other words, it bends more when you have a larger change in index of refraction. If a ray of light goes from one medium to another along the normal, it is undeflected regardless of the, ind in, uh, the index of refraction difference. In other words, we're saying this, here's our normal. If we have a ray of light come straight in, it's going to go straight out, which Snell's law would tell us as well. Right, because it'd be the sine of zero and we just get zero equals zero. Okay, and don't forget, we're measuring these angles relative to the normal, not to the to the boundary itself, but to the normal to the boundary. Are you raising your hand? What's up? Some of it does. Anytime waves change mediums, there's always some reflection and some transmission. All right. And so really that's like how you want to do sound proofing. The larger a change in medium, the more there, the greater the reflection. So if I wanted to like soundproof a room, I would want to put materials on the walls that had a much bigger difference of speed propagation from air than anything else and get it to uh, get it to reflect back more. Or you make it something porous, right? Something with a lot of holes inside of it so that every time it goes in and out of one of those holes, little pockets of air in it, there's another reflection in transmission and it gets kind of trapped inside of there. And as it makes it through, it can't make it through. Uh, kind of like with, uh, if you wanted to make like a glass window that reflected sound that was, you know, kept sound, you could make like one thick piece of glass or you could go in and make two thin pieces of glass in the same window. Here, you're going to have sound waves come in and you're going to get one reflection, one transmission, one reflection, one transmission, right? But in here, you're going to get reflection, transmission, reflection, transmission, reflection, and transmission. You know what I mean? Like, you're going to end up with less sound coming out from that because you have many more. Um, and so they do that like with a, with a, like if you've ever been in a room where it's very echoey, like if you're in a house where they've got all the furniture out and they're changing the carpet and stuff like that, it's very echoey in there. Uh, that's because you have nothing in there to absorb the sound, nothing for it to bounce around. There. If it goes inside like the carpet, it bounces around in there and gets mostly absorbed. Uh, so if you go to like old high school rooms and stuff where they have all the plastic chairs and everything, it's still not echoey in there. Everything's hard surface, but it's not super echoey. And that's because if you look up at the ceiling tiles, they have tons of holes all in them. And so the sound goes up in there and it bounces around in there and gets all these reflections and absorptions and stuff and you, you end up losing a lot of that. All right? More than you asked for, but there you go. You're going to ask a question, you're going to get a big answer usually. All right, here we go, refraction of light. Uh, so if you've ever seen that pencil trick where you put the pencil in a cup of water and it looks broken, that's refraction. It also is one of those things where if you go to like a beach that has really, really clear water, and you look down at the bottom and it looks like the bottom's like 10 feet deep, but it's really like 70 feet deep, you know, because it makes stuff underwater appear closer to the surface. Based on this, as you can see, it's doing that here with this pencil. It makes the, the you know, the actual position of the pencil. If you were looking down here at this end, you'd think, oh, the pencil's right there, but it's actually much deeper. You ever reach for something like at the bottom of the pool and you think it's not so deep, but then it, you just you keep reaching and you're still not there? Um, it's because it is deeper than it appears. And if you're underwater and look up out of water, it makes things look taller or further away from the water than they actually are. So like if you're a bird trying to get a fish, you think the fish is closer to the surface than it actually is. So maybe the fish is safer, you know, and you're a little overconfident thinking it's closer to the surface. But if the fish looks up at the bird, the fish thinks the bird's further away than it actually is, so maybe it's less careful and more willing to come to the surface or something. I don't know who gets the advantage there. Uh, but either, either way, they're both slightly incorrect. Uh, here we have mirages. Mirages are actually just reflections of the sky on the ground, where if you've ever been driving that or lost in the desert or driving down a long road on a hot day and you look out in front of you and it looks kind of shimmery and it does look like there's water on the road, uh, that's because the index of refraction changes with temperature. And so light coming from the sky actually comes down like this and it starts to bend and bend and bend and it gets bent up and goes into your eyes. 
And so what you're actually seeing is a reflection of the sky and other things off of that, off of the ground or from the air getting scooped up and bent around like that and coming over to your eyes. And that's all the other, oh, there's a waterway over there, and they start going for it. All right? Pretty neat. Uh, here you go. If light enters a medium of lower index of refraction, it will be bent away from the normal because entering a lower index means you're entering a higher speed. So going from low speed to high speed bends away from the normal. Uh, if the angle of incidence is large enough, the angle of refraction is 90 degrees. At larger incident angles, it will be totally reflected. This is what is called total internal reflection, where you get a critical angle. If you've ever been in a swimming pool or you ever do this again, or you get near a fish tank or something like that, go just underneath the water. Don't go real far down and then look at the top of the water on the far end of the pool. You won't see out of the pool. You'll see a reflection of the wall on the far side of the pool. And if you do that on a fish tank, you ever done that? When you're looking at the fish and you look up at the top of the water and it looks all mirrory and glassy, that's because of this. Because what happens is, as the light starts to go out right here, it bends away from the normal. Then as we move this light beam out a little further to a greater angle, it bends away from the normal even more. And then you do it again, and it's even more. And eventually, you'll find a place where when you do that, it bends right to 90 degrees. That, when it does that, maybe we'll make that one an orange, that is your critical angle. Anything you go above that, theta critical, anything you go above that gets totally internally reflected like a mirror. Okay? And so in order to solve for that, which I see, and that's what they're showing here, first picture, bends over, bends over, bends over, and then it goes right down, and then you get all these reflections. So, uh, yeah, theta critical, the total internal angle, let's do it right here then. So what we can say is, uh, using our Snell's law, we've got theta, theta, y'all want me to use ones or and twos are I's and R's. Ones and twos? Okay. So the incident angle sine theta incident equals theta two uh, sine theta two. And what we're interested in is when, oh, sorry, why am I putting thetas there? Those should be ends. N, N. What we're interested in is when this refracted angle over here equals 90 degrees, right? So that's what we're super interested in. We want this to be 90 degrees. If that's 90 degrees, this becomes, uh, I'm sorry, that becomes our critical angle there, if it's 90 degrees, so theta critical. Or sorry, this will be theta critical over here. I'll get it eventually. What's the sign of 90 degrees? One. So this will become one, and then we can say sine of theta critical is equal to N2 over N1, and therefore theta critical is the arc sine of N2 over N1. So if we look at this, remember this is where it bends away from the normal. So what does that tell us about how N2 relates to N1? If it's bending away from the normal. Think about what it means for speed. What does it mean for the speed between the two materials if it's bending away from the normal? Is it faster in the first material or the second material? It's faster in the second material. If the speed is faster in the second material, what does that tell you about the index or fraction of the second material compared to the first? It's lower. And so if we look at this, this works if N2 is less than N1, correct? What happens if N2 is greater than N1? And you try to take the arc sine of a number greater than one. It doesn't what? It doesn't work because you can't take the sine of any angle and get a number greater than one. So if you even try this with this rung, you try this when it's going from uh, when it's going from 
high speed to low speed, you know, the opposite way, it's not going to work. Okay, it's not going to work, and you're gonna you're gonna end up getting an error when you try to type this in. So this even only even mathematically won't work for us in the other one. So that can also even tell you the time of it. Besides, with the other one, it's always bending toward the normal, so it just bends closer and closer to 90 degrees. Oh, if you have a watch on, you can probably see the total internal or total internal reflection. If you get it bent just right, it'll start to look like that off of the air underneath the glass inside of it. Not off the top of the glass. It has to be off. It'll it'll do the total internal reflection off the bottom of the glass, going from the glass to the air inside the watch. All right. Any questions on this? Theta critical. You should be able to find that. You make the one angle equal to ninety and solve for it. Uh, next, just some examples of this. Uh, the biggest one here that's super interesting is. Anybody want to guess what that's a picture of? I don't know if it tells you that in the. Optical, if it's fiber optic. That's how those work. They are designed in such a way that they have such a large difference in the index of refraction with the air outside around it that it's almost always internally reflected. And so you can bend them and stuff like that, and it just internally reflects the whole way through. So you can take those fiber optics and bend them and stuff like that, and the light will just bounce around until it makes it all the way across. Okay, so that's how fiber optics will work for you. And then the same thing, I guess, here for the binoculars. Uh, this, uh, I don't think I want to mess with Brewster's thing. Did y'all learn about polarized light? Does anybody know what polarized light is? What? Yeah, but did you learn that in physics? Not yet, right? So. I'm going to skip this Brewster's angle stuff because this is just talking about um, polarizing light off of reflections. Uh, ultimately, it polarizes uh, uh, it, it polarizes whenever it reflects off of something. Uh, this is why they'll put polarized lenses on the front of movie cameras in order to prevent there being like reflections of the cameras in like store windows and stuff like that, because otherwise they'd be shooting out on the street or something, and you'd see the camera in the uh, in the reflection of the glass, and you, you wouldn't also be able to see through the window. Uh, so they put a polarized lens on there that then blocks out that polarized light, and you can see through the window, and you don't see a reflection of the camera and stuff like that. So, uh, And also you have those glasses for fishing. You put them on, and suddenly you can see through the water because you're not seeing all that polarized light that's reflecting off of it. So, All right, and then there's Brewster's angle. Don't need that. Here we've got lenses. Uh, we can use these to focus light. We have converging lenses and diverging lenses and different types there. Uh, for the most part, I think we're going to pretty much draw converging lenses. I'll usually draw them that way. And uh, diverging lenses like that tend to be the, the ones that are mostly, mostly done. But one of them diverges light, one of them converges light. Uh, you could think of this one you can use like for a magnifying glass and stuff like that. So dependent upon whether or not you're nearsighted or farsighted will determine whether or not your glasses that you get are converging or diverging. If you are nearsighted, that means that the light, your eye focuses it before it reaches the back of your eye. So if this is like, if this is your eyeball and the light rays come in, they actually focus before it reaches the back of your eye, they focus like here, which means that you get a blurry image on the back of your eye. All right. So what you do is put a diverging lens in there and it causes the light to diverge slightly. And then we'll actually, you know, after it diverges, we'll actually then end up focusing on the back of your eye. Uh, for farsightedness, it's the opposite. Your eyes actually cause the light to focus behind your eyes like this it's too far and so what you do is put a converging lens on there and it causes the light to focus down a little bit and then actually focus uh at the back of your eye and then you can see yeah yes yes they change the focal length yep except they do it right on your eye instead of out in front 
with glasses, I believe you have to worry about how far, oh, I mean, you have to, you have to worry about how far away the lenses are from the person's eyes and stuff like that, which is why if you take your glasses off and hold them out here like this, it, it changes what image you're seeing, right? As you move them close. So you have to worry about seeing how many centimeters is it away from your eyeball and stuff like that. Yeah. It does. You have to have a different shaped lens. I have I have a slight astigmatism too, and so my contacts are weighted such that they always orient in one way because if they orient sideways, I, it messes up my vision. So when I put them in, you blink them and they rotate down because they're weighted heavier on one side. Yeah. You, you know what astigmatism is? Where your eye is basically squished. In other words, it's got one curvature this way and a different curvature this way. Yeah, pretty common, I think. Astigmatism. All right. Um, now I lost what I was saying with the astigmatism question. Did I finish what I was saying on this page or not? Uh, I don't know. This is a nice long pause in the recording, though, at least, right? So here you can see. Uh, oh yes, that's what I was going to say. So these are. So when you wear your your eyes, when you wear your eyes. Your eyes have just a single lens on them. So think back to what we did with mirrors, where all of our real images, which could be projected onto a screen, focused onto a screen, were all inverted. The same thing is true for lenses. If you're going to put something onto a screen, it has to be a real image. And if you have just a single lens, that image is going to be upside down. So what does that tell you about how you're actually seeing everything? It's all upside down. The images on the back of your eye are upside down. Your brain has to flip them around. I remember that they talked about this when I first learned this, and they said that they took some people and they gave them these special glasses that caused them to see everything upside down. It flipped images, which their eyes then flipped, which meant on the back of their eyelids, back of their eye, the rods and cones are, uh, it was all upright. And so at first when they started off wearing these glasses, they were wearing they, they were supposed to wear them nonstop. They had a lot of trouble because the world looked upside down. However, they got used to it and their brains started fixing it. And so when they were wearing the glasses, everything looked upright and normal. And then when they finally took the glasses off and the experiment, everything looked upside down again. So pretty neat stuff. I don't know. I never did it. Let's get you some of those glasses and see what happens. I think they had to wear them for a while. It wasn't like, the, you know, it wasn't like that day. I think they started getting used to them after a couple of days, and then eventually they just stopped noticing them. Yeah, I have no idea. I've never done it. All right, so here we've got a convex lens. Uh, you can think of it like the prisms or whatever. It's, it's essentially just a converging lens. It causes the light to converge to a focal point, OK? And that will be our focus, which will be very similar mathematically to what we had before. Here we have a concave lens or a diverging lens. So diverging, as you can see by looking at it, right? And this was converging. And notice here it causes all the light to diverge away from the focal point. Causes all the light to converge away from that focal point. Okay, now we have three basic rays we can draw again. We can have a parallel ray that comes in parallel to the axis. We can have one that comes in through the focus. And then uh, we can have one that goes through the center of the lens. Last time we had it go through the center of curvature of the mirror. This time we'll have it go through the center of the lens. The one that goes through the it comes in parallel, you guessed it. The one that goes in parallel reflects through the focus. Right? Just like in the mirrors, it, ref it, it reflected back. Now it's refracting through to the focus instead of reflecting back to it. The one that goes through the center just keeps going straight through. Kind of like the one that went through the center of curvature just back, back, bounced back on itself. And then finally, the one that goes through the focus will refract out parallel. Where these meet is where your image will form for a converging lens. For a diverging lens, 
the ray that comes in parallel reflects away from the focus. The ray that comes in through the center just goes right on through the center. And the ray that comes in toward, toward the focus reflects out parallel to the principal axis like that. Okay. Those are our three main rays we can draw to get, uh, to get our images. Notice that for the diverging lens, they all diverge and they don't focus anywhere on the side of the lens where the light ends up, which means for that one, we'll do the same sort of thing. We'll trace it backwards to the front side of the lens where we would appear to see a virtual image. So just like the convex lenses, this is only virtual images. This one can do real or virtual. In fact, if you use this one on the left as a magnifying glass where you get it real close to your object and it looks enlarged and upright, you're using it as a magnifying glass and you're getting a virtual image. Okay? So that guy is going to make a virtual images. Any guesses based on what we learned about the mirrors of where that will be with the converging lens? How close do you have to get? How close did you have to get for the mirror for it to become an upright, enlarged virtual image? For the converging mirror, the, inside the focus, right? Where do you think you have to get for this? One guess. Inside the focus. If you get inside the focus, that's when you, you can use it as a magnifying glass. At the focus, we're going to get no image. Outside the focus, we're going to get the same results we were getting for the other one, except instead of saying the center, we'll say twice the focus. So like outside twice the focus, we get a reduced, um, we get a reduced real image. At twice the focus, we get the same size of a virtual, of a real image. Inside, between the focus and twice the focus, we get that large version of, of a virtual image. A real image, sorry. At the focus, no image or image at infinity. And inside, enlarged virtual. So we're going to get the same result to it. Okay? It's, it's pretty neat here. So if you look here, just like with the con, uh, convex mirrors, we end up with nothing but reduced virtual images here. They're all reduced and they're all virtual. And there's your ray diagram for it, the only, the only option. After that, you've got this one here, where again, we can do this same sort of thing. If you are there twice the focus, which this picture looks like it is done, you get an image that is the same size, inverted, real magnification of negative one. If you go closer, you get an enlarged image. Or no, this is inside the focus. Look at that. Inside the focus, you get an enlarged upright virtual image. Okay, but the ray diagrams are going to work just the same as they did before. So let's add a quick page in here and I'll show you. All right, so we've done, so let's do outside the focus. So let's say this is our converging lens. Let's say this is our focus. This is twice our focus. F, P, F. We put an object out here. We draw our three rays in, in parallel. The focus, got to gotta put them on the back side too, right? In parallel, out through the focus. Then we've got in, in through the focus, and then out parallel. And then we've got in through the center and straight on through. And so that will give us an image right here, which you can see clearly, even from my not perfect drawing, is reduced real, reduced real, inverted. Okay. And I might leave you to practice the others. 
very similar to the ones that I did for the mirrors. You can do one at twice the focus, between the focus and twice the focus. At the focus, all your rays should end up parallel. Therefore, you get no image or image at infinity. And then the one inside the focus is already done for you. But try copying this over, doing this a few times, OK? Now, Finland's equation, it's the same basic derivation with the similar triangles from before. And you end up with the same equation. Now, with the mirrors, we said everything in front of the mirror was positive. Everything on the back side of the mirror was negative. This is a little different. Like with the mirrors, the object distance always positive. OK? Unlike with the mirrors, the positive side to the image is opposite to the positive side to the object, because that's where the light goes. And that's what makes this equation still work. If you notice here in the derivation, the triangles are on the back side. So for the image, di is positive if on opposite side of lens. And then di is negative if on same side as lens. So any image that appears on the back side of your lens is a real image with a positive image distance. Because that's where the light actually goes to. You can put a screen there, right? If I have a lens like this one, and I put a movie screen right here, I will see a picture of that arrow nice and focused right there on it. If we look at the virtual one, if I put a movie screen right here, one, I'm not going to really see anything except, you know, some of the light blurred out on it because I'm not even letting the light make it to the lens now. But let's pretend we could let the light make it to the lens and then we threw that right in the middle, right? We're not going to get an image on there because the light doesn't ever come back to the screen. It continues on out this way. It just appears, if you're over here looking through it, it appears like that's the image you see. If you look through that lens at something on the other side, it will appear reduced, right? So your eye, your eye has to be on this side, right? This is where you have to look from. Okay, Oops. eyelashes. Your eye has to be on this side. If your eye is on this side, you're just going to see the actual object and not the image of it. OK? Any questions on that? Does that make sense? Does it? Yes, no, maybe. Thumbs up, thumbs down, yeah? OK, good. So in order for this equation to work and not have to memorize, we have to make that little change there. That also means for converging lenses, F is positive for converging. That's just like, just like concave mirrors. And F is negative for diverging lenses like convex mirrors. In fact, all your same results for the mirrors, all your results for the concave mirrors are the same results for the converging lens. And all your results for the, uh, for the convex lens is the same for the diverging lens. And they are mathematically then the same by making this switch here, OK? If we make that switch, we're good. They work out both mathematically. So if you really wanted, if you got like a problem on a converging lens, you can essentially take everything and like swap the problem to a, you know, to a concave mirror, solve the problem, and then just draw everything mirror imaged over to the other side like it went through it. You know what I mean? So if you have a converging lens, you can solve the mirror 
install it like the mirror if you're used to it, and then just say it's the lens stuff. You know what I mean? You'll get the same numbers and same results. Same places for virtual images, same places for real images, same image distances and stuff. If they have the same focal length, and stuff, it's all going to work out the same. All right, so that's why we have the same thin lens equation and the same magnification here. Negative di over do. A negative, ultimately negative magnification will give us a, uh, a real inverted image. And a positive magnification means it's upright and virtual. All right. Uh, so here, that's just a summation of everything I just told you, except uh, except uh, uh, you know, memorize it versus the making the switch, like I said, so that it still fits just like the mirror. It's just making that one change where the object is always positive, but but now like the backside of the lens becomes the positive side, right? So do is positive for real images. That's on the back side of the lens, but it's positive. So that whole chart or understand this much of it, whichever is works for you. Okay. Uh, here we can start talking about dispersions and rainbows. Or I guess how much do we have left? We only have a few pages left, right? Just the rainbow stuff. Um, so the basic idea of a rainbow is just real quick, different colors refract or have a different index of refraction in material. So if you're looking here, you can see that the blue light is refracting more than the red light. So that means when you send it through this prism and it comes over here, there's going to be a spreading out of the color because blue light has a different index inside of that material than the red light did. And this is ultimately where we get the rainbow here. Uh, that dispersion is we have this with a droplet of water. As the light goes in, it refracts by different amounts for the red and the blue light or violet light and it gets spread out, and then you see that rainbow. There is an old uh, YouTube video, if you want, I'll probably post it for you just in case you can watch, and it would be everything you'd ever want to know about rainbows in this effect. It's actually pretty interesting. The guy's kind of funny. Tells you why they're curved, uh, what colors are always on top, why really like every rainbow is actually a double rainbow, whether you can see it or not, and stuff like that. Uh, it's pretty interesting. I'll, uh, I'll uh, post it for you if, if somebody's nice enough to remind me because otherwise I'll probably forget. Anyway, it's, it's pretty interesting. Okay, and then so that's why you end up seeing this when there's a bunch of droplets and you see a breaking apart of the colors and you see a rainbow. And there you go, you see one right there with a double rainbow. Also notice, where is it darkest? Between the two rainbows, isn't it? Can y'all see that on those screens? It's lightest here, dark here, and then darker over here again. But it's darkest in the middle, brightest over here, and like medium over here. If you watch the video, he explains exactly why that's the case. Pretty interesting. All right, but nothing we need to go into for this level. All right, so we have like four minutes. Let's take a look here. Okay. Uh, so one night, while on vacation in the Caribbean, you walk to the end of the dock and, for no particular reason, shine your laser pointer into the water. When you shine a beam of light on the water, a horizontal distance of 2.4 meters uh, from the dock, you see a glint of light from a shiny object on the sandy bottom, perhaps a gold bloom. If the pointer is 1.8 meters above the surface of the water and the water is 5.5 meters deep, what is the horizontal distance? Uh, from the end of the dock to the shiny object. So we have a dock here. You're standing here. You've got your nifty new laser pointer. Uh, you shine the beam of light over the water. And a horizontal distance of 2.4 meters. So here comes our light. Which way is it going to bend? This is our normal. Which way is it going to bend? Toward or away from the normal? All right, this is air, and this is water. Uh, it's going to bend toward the normal, so it's going to bend like this and go down 
and apparently hit something that's on the bottom of the ocean or bottom of the water there. And so we know that this distance here is 2.4 meters. Uh, pointer is 1.8 meters above the surface of the water. And the water is, if we come right down to here, let's make this triangle here, 5.5 meters deep. Uh, and so what we want ultimately is we need to find this distance here and add it to the 2.4. So if we look at this, we know that this is theta 1, this is theta 2. Um, what we need is the index of refraction of water. So we'll come back to that. And so we need theta 1, right? We're going to use n1 sine theta 1 equals n2 sine theta 2. We're going to say n1 equals 1. And we're going to say n2 equals, come back here. Where was that? What is it for water? Ah, uh, where is it? Come on. Oh, there it is. Water. Where's water? 1.33. Oh, I should have known that. 1.33. And then what we can do is find theta 1. Well, we can find theta 1 by finding this little angle in here. We'll call that phi. How can I find that angle in there? Tangent, right? Tangent of phi is equal to 1.8 over 2.4. The meters will cancel. And so then we can also then say that theta 1 equals 90 minus phi. So we can say theta 1 is equal to 90 minus, uh, 90 minus the arc tan of 1.8 over 2.4. And then we need to find theta 2 in order to build out this triangle here, right? And we can build out that triangle. Uh, then we can solve this one. So essentially plug this in. This is going to be 1 times the sine of 90 minus arc tangent of 1.8 over 2.4 has to equal n2, which is 1.33 times the sine of theta 2. Solve that for theta 2. That will give you this angle over here, right? And then you can do 90 minus it to get this angle, find this length there, and add that to the 2.4, and you'll get the total answer, total distance. Yeah, you could. You mean use theta 2 and find this triangle length down here? Yeah, it's the same thing. All right, any questions on that? Try to finish that one up, and if you have any trouble with it, let me know, and I'll finish it in the next class. Okay, and then we'll do, I maybe have to start making some, try to start making some videos again and hope it actually works, right? <laughs>